As I said, that concludes our opening statement by members. I'd now like to have our first panel of witnesses to testify. First, we have Mr. Jeffrey Almer of Savage, Minnesota, whose 72 year old mother Shirley died after eating salmonella contaminated peanut butter at a nursing home. And I should also note he has a photograph of his mother that I'm sure he'll explain to us as we move on. Mr. Lou Tuzano of uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota, whose 78 year old father Clifford died after eating salmonella contaminated peanut butter at a nursing home. And Mr. Peter K. Hurley, a police officer from Wilsonville, Oregon, whose three-year-old son Jacob was severely sickened by salmonella after eating Austin crackers. It's the policy of this subcommittee to take all testimony under oath. Please be advised that you have the right under the rules of the House to be advised by counsel during your testimony. Do you wish to be represented by counsel, gentlemen? No. Okay. Everyone indicates no. Now I'm going to ask you to rise and raise your right hand, take the oath. You swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give in this matter be the tr truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? I do. Let the record reflect that witnesses replied in the affirmative. You are now under oath. We will begin with your opening statement. If you don't mind, Mr. Almeyer, would you begin, please? Five minutes opening statement. And we appreciate you all being here and coming here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members for inviting me to testify today. My name is Jeff Almer, and I'm here today on behalf of the family of Shirley Almer, my mother, and as a member of STOP, Safe Tables Our Priority, a nonprofit organization that represents foodborne illness victims nationwide. My sisters, Vicki and Ginger, are also with me today. Shirley Almer had a lot of sisu, which in her Finnish heritage describes a person with spunk, fortitude, and determination. That's why her death on December 21st from, of all things, salmonella contaminated peanut butter came as such a shock to our family. In May of 2007, mom had a couple dime-sized spots of cancer diagnosed on her right lung. She decided to have it removed at the University of Minnesota and was subsequently diagnosed cancer-free. She took a family trip to Florida a year later to celebrate with her children and grandchildren, and it was such a joy to see her enjoying life after that terrible scare. Then in July 2008, she suffered a seizure and was diagnosed with a brain tumor. The prognosis was hopeful, and she was determined to do whatever it took to beat cancer for a second time. A second seizure robbed her of movement and speech capabilities. She underwent brain radiation and a gamma knife procedure. She was required to stay at the university hospital but fought back through rehab and regained the use of her limbs and her speech, despite the diagnosis of some doctors. It was through sheer determination and a can-do attitude she overcame all of that, never complaining. One of her wonderful rehab nurses told me she was a shining light and said she was absolutely amazed at the recovery. Mom was released in early October to recuperate with her family and was once again declared cancer-free. She made plans. She bought Christmas presents. She wanted to get another puppy. She wanted to visit her sister Mary in Arizona, and she was looking forward, forward to being around to watch her grandchildren grow up. Unfortunately, she suffered a urinary tract infection around Thanksgiving and needed to check in short term to a rehab care facility for treatment. Her short stay was supposed to end the Monday prior to Christmas when she would then join the family for the holidays. She began to complain of stomach cramping and had diarrhea. There was a downward spiral from that point on. Our family was absolutely stunned to learn on the day before her scheduled release that doctors were giving her hours to live. It was very unexpected and equally hard to fathom how she could have gotten to this point. We were devastated as we ended up saying our tearful goodbyes and watching her last breaths on that Sunday. It was just after the new year that my sister Ginger was informed by the Minnesota Department of Health about the positive test for salmonella. A week before her death, she had unknowingly consumed salmonella laced peanut butter while in her immune compromised state of health. Cancer couldn't claim her, but peanut butter did. Now that we understood the cause of her death, our grief was replaced by anger as we struggled to accept this preventable tragedy. Our family feels cheated. My mom should be here today. 
Her death and the deaths of seven others could have been so easily prevented if it were not for the greed and avarice of the peanut corporation of America. PCA appears to be more concerned with squeezing every dollar possible at the expense of sanitary conditions and sound food manufacturing processes. Every company needs to have a moral and ethical comp compass when producing the nation's food supply. In this absence, we need a cohesive regulatory system to serve as our safety net. Too often it's reactive, if at all. While they were not expecting to kill anyone, PCA now has the blood of eight victims on their hands, along with the shattered health of a known 600 others, and they've devastated their own community with the unemployment. Their legacy is now that of a company that did what it could get away with until their shoddy practices has led to the nation's largest recall. Their behavior is criminal in my opinion. I want to see jail time and I want to see them serve nothing but the putrid sludge they've been trawling out. I don't believe anyone in this country buys all the protests of innocence they've been, been saying. Surely Almer loved this country but was terribly let down by a broken and ineffective food system with abysmal oversight. She was let down in the worst possible way by the very government whose responsibility it is to protect its citizens' health and safety. We cannot continue to ignore the public health threat caused by poorly regulated and contaminated foods. We cannot allow food safety to be continually underfunded and expose unsuspecting Americans to deadly pathogens. This brings up many important questions. How much time and money will end up being spent on the act of recalling over a thousand food products? What about the lost productivity and medical expenses for the sickened? When will we have a proactive instead of a reactive system? And my last question would be, when will all these painful deaths and sickness stop being collateral damage? The government and the industry need to work together to correct a multitude of problems. I am proud to be asking for change on behalf of my mother, Shirley, and on behalf of STOP. Although this country has many important issues right now, I'm urging President Obama and the distinguished members of Congress to make the safety of our nation's food supply a priority. It's imperative that Americans trust that their health is not compromised by the food on their plate. We love you, Mom, and we miss you every day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Elmeyer. Mr. Tuzno, your opening statement, please. If you want to submit a longer statement for the record, it will be included. But if you would, please, Mr. Tuzno. Before I begin, Mr. Chairman, could you please uh, start the video over here to my left, please?
Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my father was a highly decorated Korean War veteran. He fought in many difficult battles in his years in Korea and was awarded three Purple Hearts for his valor. He faithfully served his country for over 22 years and he loved every minute of it. The only thing that he loved more was his family. He was a proud father of six, Paul, with me here today, Marshall, Susan, Calvin, Jane, and myself. As you can see by those photos, he loved spending time with his grandchildren and his great-grandchildren. He had 15 grandchildren and 14 great-grandchildren. But he was a man that was physically and psychologically scarred from Korea. And early on, it was difficult for our family. But like most battles in his life, he overcame it. So much so that he became one of the most generous men that many had known. The night of his funeral, I was having a conversation with my brother-in-law, Dan Herrick, also with me today. And he shared a story with me of when he and my sister were first married. Like, like most young married couples, times were tight back then. And my father knew that. And he would invite him over, make up something, make up a story, saying, my, my, my car starters won't, won't work right. Something's wrong with the brakes. Something's wrong with the door. Come on over and take a look at it. And he's out, he would always give Dan and my sister Jane a little something for the trouble of coming over. He helped a lot of us through the years, including his, old, his own parents when he joined the Army as a teenager. He sent money back home because times were tight then as well. As long as he had a few dollars in his pocket, he was more than willing to help anyone. His final battle occurred in December of, the, of 2008 when he ate some, peanut, some contaminated peanut butter from PCA. He suffered for weeks until he, he finally died on January 12, 2009. He had just entered a, a full-time care for health care facility in Brainerd, Minnesota a month earlier. He had few goals left in life except for one. He wanted to live to be older than his father. He wanted to live to be 80 years old. He was 78 when he died, a year and a half too early. We can't be certain of how many years dad was robbed, was robbed of. And because of the way he died, because of all the media attention, our grieving process has been different than most. We should not be sitting here in front of you today, any of us. We can no longer pick up the phone and ask him what game he's watching today. My nieces and nephews can no longer crawl and over grandpa and have their photos taken with them. My brother Marshall and my sister-in-law Anne, who are fortunate enough to spend the last three and a half years with him, can, can no longer go to his house daily and just check in and see how he's doing. My brother Paul, who spoke with him frequently, can no, can no longer call him just when he feels like it. He has trouble sleeping at night now. Not just because we lost our father, but the senseless way that this happened. What happened to our father, the seven other families like the Almers, the over 600 others sickened like the Hurleys, is not new. Over the years, there have been hundreds of similar outbreaks and other heartbreaking stories. Why has this been allowed to happen. Two years ago, the Peter Pan outbreak affected more than 600 people in 47 states. Two years later, here we are again asking for change. I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, how can we truly be leaders of the free world if we can't keep our own citizens safe from the food that we eat every single day? We have a blind faith that when we go to a grocery store, the food there is also safe. It clearly is not. Do not let the death of my father, the seven others, and the hundred sickened be in vain. Please do your job. Do not let us be back here next year or the year after experiencing the same thing. Companies like PCA and Mr. Parnell, 
who make our food should have rules that they live by. Companies should be inspected more than once every five years. Companies should not be allowed to shop around for lab results. Companies like King Nut should not be allowed to slap a label on their product they receive from a factory that they know nothing about, never visited, nor even ever inspected once. The FDA should also have the right to recall contaminated food themselves and not wait for companies to do so on their own. We can't allow the number of FDA inspectors and inspections to continue to decline. My father was a good man. He faithfully served his country. The system that was set up to protect all of us here today has failed. My father died because he ate peanut butter. Thank you, Ms. Tisno. Mr. Hurley, your testimony, please. Good morning, Congress Congressmen, Congresswomen, and committee members. My name is Peter Hurley. My wife, Brandy, and I are parents of three children, Lauren, five, Jacob, three, Alyssa, eight months. I'm a police officer in Portland, Oregon, and my wife is a marketing manager. Our whole family, baby and all, have traveled from Oregon to Washington, D.C. to testify before you regarding the salmonella outbreak that has affected us, as well as hundreds, if not more likely, thousands of fellow Americans. I want to take a moment to acknowledge the eight families who have lost loved ones. Eight people have died due to PCA's willful negligence. We were just lucky. It could have been very different for us. We made this journey to appear before you because we felt it important enough for you to hear our story of how the Peanut Corporation of America poisoned our son. We want you to hear how Jacob and a PCA supplied product are genetically linked in hopes that you will take action to protect our food supply. Jacob's story began with him becoming ill with diarrhea and vomiting in early January. He was sallow, lethargic, and probably had a fever that we missed. In a few days, he began to have blood in his diarrhea. We took him to the pediatrician. A few days later, the pediatrician called to let us know that the lab results had come back and that Jacob had salmonella poisoning. At this point, we did not know how Jacob got the poisoning, and because of that, we did not know how to protect the rest of the family. All we knew was that five or six people had already died in a new salmonella outbreak. At that time, only King Nut Peanut Butter, a PCA product, was listed as a source, which we did not have. What had we unknowingly given him that had given him salmonella poisoning? As Jacob's diarrhea continued, my wife was given the okay from our pediatrician's office for Jacob to eat his favorite comfort food, Austin Toasty Crackers with peanut butter. The very food that later, we later found was the cause of his poisoning. So here we have a boy who's trying to get over food poisoning and one of the foods that would seem safe even to the people in the pediatric medical community is the exact product that is, contaminate, is continuing to poison him. A week later, Dr. Bill Keene from Oregon's Office of Disease Prevention and Epidemiology came to our house at 5 o'clock on a Saturday night. As a friend said, this is like having the head of the FBI coming out to take fingerprints. On that Saturday night, Dr. Keene took custody of our supply of Austin Toasty crackers with peanut butter, manufactured by Kellogg's with a PCA product. One week later, Dr. Keene called us to say that Jacob and the crackers he had taken from our house had an exact DNA subtype match for salmonella. Three out of the six packages of crackers he tested were positive, and that was all that we had left. The issue is no longer what had we done unknowingly, but what had PCA done knowingly. Jacob continued to have diarrhea for 11 days. We had to be extremely vigilant to ensure that there was never any cross-contamination between Jacob and Alyssa, our seven-month-old. If Alyssa had come down with salmonella poisoning, there is a good chance that we would be one of the families who had lost a loved one due to PCA's willful negligence. I have read the FDA's most recent report. This was not an accident. It sickens me to no end that a company and its employees could knowingly allow a tainted product to go out the door and into the nation's food supply. Does no one have a conscience anymore? People would be in utter outrage if they heard of a police officer putting a loaded gun to someone's head, pulling the trigger, and then in the horrific aftermath say, I was just hoping that the bullet in the chamber wouldn't fire. 
We, the United States, are the first world. Have we fallen to second world food status for our food safety? As the woman taking care of our dog while we are here in DC said, even my dog is not safe. What is this, China? Where do we go from here? We need to have a faster 911 oriented medical response for food contamination in order to prevent further innocent victims. We need FDA inspectors out there with the authority to stop production immediately when there is a problem. We need the FDA to have the ability to criminally prosecute quickly and effectively. Oregon has the dubious distinction of suffering the first ever domestic terrorism in the United States. It was carried out by the Rajneeshis in the 1980s. They sprayed, they sprayed a salad bar in the Dalles, Oregon with salmonella. If a small group of religious fanatics in Oregon could pull it off, who else could? None of us should be so naive as to think that Al-Qaeda could not easily taint our food supply. If the very well-funded Al-Qaeda could put its mind to it, I shudder to think of what could happen to this country when people do not know where to turn to find safe, uncontaminated food. The panic, pandemonium, and lawlessness would be horrific. I will leave you with my favorite quote by the 19th century author and poet, philosopher, Johann Wolfgang Goethe. Few men have imagination enough for reality. On behalf of all Americans, my whole family, Jake and I ask you to please have imagination enough to think of the worst case scenario and to work to protect against it. Thank you.